I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Q&A. Milo's joining us today. Got a fairly lengthy list of questions here, so I'm going to muddle through this one. And then after this show, Milo's going to take on the role uh, of reading the questions, and then the panel will talk about them so uh, forgive me if I'm kind of reading through these and fumbling a bit so uh, first question is I've heard reports of Bigfoot cutting down or moving trees to indicate either the boundaries of their territory or the direction of their travel uh, what are or what they're up to I'm not sure what that is have you seen these signs and what are they exactly and how do you tell they're Bigfoot not just coincidence Care to take a stab at that one, Forrest? Oh, heavens. You know what? I've never seen the, <clears throat> the tea... Sh- <laughs> How I can't talk either. Uh, <laughs> I have never seen the tree structures. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen plenty of them that Chuck has sent me, and I've seen some things that you have sent me. Um, <clears throat> I could think that they would... You know, I understand the nest building, um, but... Uh, I've, the one thing that intrigues me greatly is the X's, and uh, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, that intrigues me; it really does. But I, I will tell you that I think that Chuck would far be far better at answering this question because I know he has some theories on what they're doing out there. I mean, you know, I, I really would be just—it'd be a shot in the dark on my part because I, you don't see any other primates. Let me clarify that: mm-hmm. you don't see any other primates doing that kind of uh, structure building, except uh, you know your chimpanzees and your gorillas do build nests to sleep in. Mm-hmm. That is all that I know of, and that's all that I can relate to it. So I, I, I'm going to throw that at Chuck. Well, there. I think it really depends on where you are. Um, because I've spent a lot of time all over the West Coast in the mountains. I've never seen structures. The things I've sent you are from other people who send me things. And usually I'll only show something if it's if it's something that was under really strange circumstances and somebody that I know, you know, uh, that said they found this and it was, you know, ABC or whatever. Um, so the only, I mean... Well, what about the structures that you were telling me about that y'all thought might have been uh, uh, nursery um, oh. and then the, 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 the bedding we'll, up in the trees we'll, and we'll, such. We'll, we'll save that for another time. That's the kind oh, of okay. the kind of structures okay. we're talking about is like stuff on the ground uh, and the oh. stuff Chuck's familiar with. Uh, so, But okay. what this person is asking is like territorial marking. Um, territorial <clears throat> marking and I guess how you would know whether it's Sasquatch and not just something that's normal, you know, weather related or whatever, uh, was something that I've discovered back in 1991. We were up in the mountains and came on this tree. And I've talked about this before where the tree was, we, we'd hiked into the Washougal river watershed. This is Skamania County, Washington. And, uh, we didn't see anything in the watershed. So we decided to, hike up this ridge to a saddle and the saddle um on this on this low spot in this ridge was actually kind of a dividing point between two drainage systems up there and my friend jack and i had been theorizing because there were a lot of sightings on either side of this saddle that this might be a conduit you know they were coming up this ridge and over you know from one drainage system to the other one in fact the Washougal River was where I had my second sighting. And then on the other drainage system uh, was Yakult. So there was a lot of activity on both sides. So since we were back in there, and it was hard to get into it, it took us five different times to get into that watershed. It was very difficult terrain. Um, We decided to hike up the ridge, and we got about a little over 2,000 feet up in elevation and uh, closed canopy, you know, nice July, sunny, warm day. And we stopped to take a break. 
and we found this Doug fir tree. And the Doug fir tree was probably, you know, 15, maybe 20 feet tall, about three inches thick. And, and I had my tape measure, so I measured where this break was. It was broke 90 degrees over, eight feet, one inches off the ground. I mean, just a complete clean break. There was no disease. There was no markings on the trunk and the bark or anything. There was no indication whatsoever of how this happened. And then as we looked around and I took pictures, we noticed about 100 yards off to the northeast there was another one. So we went to that one. I measured that, and it was within an inch of the same height as the first tree. And then, you know, again, I took, took the measurements, the trunk thickness, pictures, all that stuff. And we noticed off in the same direction there was yet another one we found a total of 13 of these in that line going northeast and then decided we better leave to, so we could get because we had to cross the river uh before we had to do it before it got dark so we got out of there so anyway i talked to a friend of mine who was uh, a, a klamath uh indian and he kind of chuckled when i showed him the pictures and he says oh you finally found that <laughs> i said what do you mean what do you mean i found that finally and he says well he says that's he says that's how they mark their territory. He says and what you found is where the big guy of the group was going off to the next feeding area, and that was his sign to the others that that's where we're going next. We're going that way. And I'm like, wow. So, you know, it wasn't just me finding something. It was it was unusual to begin with. I mean, I've seen, you know, having grown up in the Northwest, you know, Milo, you know, uh, all right. the damage that weather does to trees and other vegetation. You've seen Yeah, the, but it doesn't do... No, you, a, a snap like that. No, you, you see it a million times. This was in a closed canopy, and it was in the middle of summer, no bad weather for weeks. I mean, and and just what it was protected. There was no way, and it was a healthy tree. And and like I said, there was a line of them. So, and then his verification, you know, from from the Klamath folks saying that yeah, that's what this is. Um, so when you it's easy for people, I suppose, to go out because you know weather does a lot of things to trees. You know, if you found one snapped over, you might jump to conclusions. And, and again, being kind of a skeptic, I'm very picky about when I say, and, and usually if I find something that I say is probably Bigfoot related, it's associated with footprints and things like that also. There's usually, you know, attendant evidence that says, yes, this is probably what did this. So in these cases, and you don't find, you don't find this particular marking just anywhere. When we were in Oregon, and I've said this before, I told the guys we had to drive, I think about 30 miles through the forest uh, from one area we were working to another area that we needed to go look at. And I said, watch along the way. Tell me how many of these you see. And through that 30 mile trek through the forest, nobody saw a single one of these trees broken like that, not one. So I told them, what, sometimes what you don't see is just as important as what you do see. Because if you saw it often, then it's natural. It's not manufactured by something. That makes sense. It really does. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you a question then. You remember back when you and I first started talking, and I told you about the situation on my property with these, you know, I've got juniper trees here, or cedar trees, as mm -hmm. we call them. As, uh, that, I mean, they're big ones. They're, I don't have little ones. I have big ones. And my grandfather had years ago had trimmed these things up so that they would actually grow. Uh, it took all the undergrowth off the bottom of them so that they would actually bush out and actually grow like a regular tree. Well, what I was finding was these two and three inch thick limbs pulled down and then twisted. And yes, twisting was another on. one. Yeah, and, and I mean, this was like in a, long, in a row of all my trees. And that's, you know, if it had just been one, I would have not probably paid that close of attention to it. But, I mean, all of a sudden I'm looking up there and it's in every freaking tree. And I'm like, wait a minute, this didn't just happen, you know, and, and wind doesn't do that. And, um, you know, <laughs> we don't have snow load here, obviously, obviously. So, um, and, you know. And there's historic. Yeah, there's historical Bizarre. there's historical references to it too. There's a story even John Green had in his book, and it was from a publication. Uh, it was an article in Sports Field magazine, I believe, from 1963. So the incident happened probably 20 years prior to that, probably in the 1940s. 
Uh, there were a couple of guys they were trapping in Alaska, and it, um, I can't think of the name of the article offhand, but it's it's in one of my books. But um, to make it short, you know, there was a group of Dena natives, the Indians, who you know they knew who these guys were. They didn't weren't particularly friendly, but they respected each other because you know both the natives and and these white trappers would respect each other's traps and things so they wouldn't you know there was kind of that mutual respect they didn't really communicate with each other but they respected each other uh so these these indians came into their camp one day and and they said the chief was kind of a a tough individual and and you know like apparently it took a bit for him to actually bring his group into these outsiders camp and they said that uh uh, there was something they called Gilyuk in the area. And he said that, you know, they were there hunting caribou. Gil- Gilyuk didn't eat caribou and ate men. And uh, yeah, they said basically they didn't bother white men, so they wanted to camp with them, hoping that it wouldn't bother them. And mm. uh, so they said, we can prove it. We can show you his mark. So they took the, took these two guys to this uh, area where there was a, it was a sapling birch tree. And he, and he just described it as, as twisted like a matchstick. And I'm thinking to myself, now you have to think of the time period. You know, we think of matchsticks as these little paper matches, right? You know, mat, right. matchsticks in the 40s would have been wood. Mm-hmm. So how do you twist a matchstick? Well, it was probably snapped. Or it was twisted. Um, so, they, you know, they, they were going to go make the camp with these folks. And by the time they went there, the chief had been taken by this thing in the middle of the night. And, and they assumed gone. His clothes were, his long underwear was tore off him and found on the ground, and he was gone. So um, it, it's just interesting. It was an interesting reference, though, to the, the mark. They knew what the creature's mark was. It's the same kind of thing we find now. And, and talk about Twisted here in Northern California, one of the areas I work up here, um, we went... And I can't remember, it was probably 2005 or so. We were up in that area for a week. And we came upon a stand of pine trees, young pine trees. They were, again, they were like the one in Washougal. They were maybe 15 feet tall, 2 to 3 inches thick in the trunk. And there was probably 10 or 15 of these trees in this little cluster. And right in the middle of the cluster, and again, this was the middle of July. And in this area, it's, you know, bad weather was long gone up there. So the one tree in the center of this grouping, about seven feet off the ground, it it looked just like if you were to take a wet wash rag and wring the water out of it, that's what the trunk looked like. You could see... Well, that's what these cedar trees look like. You could see all the way through the trunk of the tree, these gaps were so big. Yeah. I mean, there's simply nothing else that would do that. It would take Uh -uh. take hands to do do it. Do you have pictures of that? I do, yeah. Can you send me some? Yeah, I'll send you pictures. That way I'd know that that's when you see this and know what it is, you'll recognize it every time. Okay. Well, something that disturbed me, and I know we're getting off the Q and A here, but uh and I I did send you and Tom some pictures of this is after I put the, the six foot fence all the way around the property, um and you know the the guy that was working on the fence that found those uh, circles back there. Um, I all of a sudden walked out one morning and uh, one of the cedar trees out here had been done that way and it had it wasn't not it was not that way the night before. And um, <laughs> um, after I had well you know what I'm talking about what happened here this last week. Um, I actually found another one of those twists, and now I'm like, after what you just told me about what the Indian said, um, I think that uh, that puts a whole new perspective on the situation. It does. And and there was another way they talked also. Now, and again, it's going to be different, I think, with different regions, you know, just different the different variants of these creatures and how, how they live in their areas. Um but but my native friends also told me that um, there was a, another reason they would do an area. Now, if there was an area of a lot of human activity, they might 
They might mark the area around as kind of a warning to others of their kind that this was a place of a lot of human activity. And I've actually seen that once and, and oh. would, would never have thought about it unless I had talked to him and he told me this. Hmm. Yeah. That's. I yeah, like well, that. Milo, Milo doesn't know what happened last week, so. No, I um, didn't. Yeah. I'm... You know. No, maybe you should, maybe should can... tell him. Well, I, okay, well. <laughs> um, I was uh, <laughs> sitting in here. I was actually on the phone with Chuck. And if um, Chuck's out there, he can verify all this. Um, I. I was in the bedroom and the, the the light came on on the end of the trailer. And he was kind of joking around with me. He said, well, get up and look out the window. Maybe it's just standing out there, staring out there, waiting for you to come to the window. And I'm like, Chuck, you're not funny. You're just not funny at all. And uh, I, I just, if y'all can visualize me looking through the window and seeing a Bigfoot standing just on the other side of the pane of glass, you can imagine that this anthropologist was not real excited about that, that prospect. I was terrified. I will not lie to you. I was terrified. Well, I did not get up and look out the window because I just didn't want to even imagine that I was going to be looking at another one looking back at me through the window. So anyway, the, the light eventually goes off. Okay. Well, Milo, this light can't be turned on by a cat or a dog walking. It has to be at least a human height. Okay. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> here, a little while later, probably 15 minutes goes by, light comes on again. So I'm like, okay, well, both of y'all know that I had spinal surgery and I was having a little bit of difficulty. It, I can get out of the bed. It's just kind of standing up. Once I get to the edge of the bed, it's kind of low. So I uh, was having a little difficulty getting up and I went over to the window and I looked out. Well, there's nothing there. And I'm telling him, I said, Chuck, there's nothing there. Thank God there's nothing there. There's nothing there. And he's laughing at me, you know. Well, I lay back down. Fifteen minutes later, right as rain, here goes the light again. Wow. And Yeah. And so at that point, I'm like, okay, this is getting old. So I get up and I look out the window again. Nothing out there. Well, now mind you, Cadney, I haven't heard a peep out of him. So I'm not particularly too alarmed, okay? Um, well, I heard something in the kitchen go boom. And I thought, oh my goodness, what have the cats knocked off now? Oh my so God. I walked out there and it was my dog. It was my, uh, Belgian Malinois. She, I, and, and this was my fault. I had left her cage, her kennel. I have to kill her at night in a great big kennel because she does things like tearing down curtains and, you know, while mama's sleeping and chewing up CDs and all sorts of stuff. She's worse than a two-year-old kid. And um, they're just busy, busy. they got a lot of energy. So I put her in a kennel, which she's fat, hot, fine in. And But she had I had not latched the door. She just pushed it open. She was kind of wandering around, you know. And, uh, and of course, knocked something over. And um, so she went to the, the, the back door, and she wanted, you know, I thought, oh, she probably needs to go potty. So I went over the door, and... Um, I let her out, and I'm <clears throat> I'm standing out there on the porch, talking to Chuck, and I'm not kidding you. She goes over. She has one particular place that she goes and does her uh, uh, little her yep, job, her business. Yeah, and as she goes over there, and she she's uh, uh, doing her thing, and I I told Chuck I said, well, she just needed to go potty. That's what it is, and and I'm not kidding. And Will's gonna laugh when I say this. It hadn't been three seconds after Chuck said that, that at least the dogs hadn't barked. Three seconds. One, two, three. And I'm not kidding you. Lagatha spun around. She's standing up on uh, with her feet up on this fence. She's looking through the fence, and she is snapping, snarling, and everything else. And I'm like, oh, good Lord, what has just happened here? And, and Cadney... The whole time was asleep, and I mean to send you a picture of his kennel so you know what I'm talking about, Will. He was in his kennel the whole time, sound asleep. He didn't even get out when when Lagatha came to go, went out to go potty. And 
But as soon as he heard her do that, I mean, he was out, and what he saw, what she saw, and I was the only one that couldn't see a dang thing. And um, they were both looking up my driveway. And Cagney was standing up, jumping up and down in his kennel. Uh, and he just came right out of his doghouse, and, and he was the same tone of voice. I mean, we're talking about these dogs who were looking for blood. And she went, I'm screaming at her. Poor Chuck's ears, eardrums probably burst because I'm standing there holding the phone, screaming at the dog, don't go. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, my God, if this is a Bigfoot, they're going to grab her. And she said, they're going to kill my dog. And she went right down the inside of the fence, out the gate, and then up my driveway. And I have a long driveway, mind you. And that was when I heard the gravel. It's a caliche driveway, and you can hear when somebody or something, because I could hear Lagatha running, too, as well. And, I mean, I'd never seen that dog run so fast in uh, my life. And whatever it was, was running up the driveway. And my posts are um, oil fill metal posts. We use a lot of pipe fencing around here in Texas. And uh, I, because the fire truck when the house burned down broke my uh, electric gate, I just haven't had the funds to, you know, redo my gate. And uh, the, uh, it's chained now. And the chain rattled. So whatever it was went over the gate. It had wow. to have hit the gate or launched itself over the gate, you know, and mm-hmm. it, that gate rattled and the pipe, uh, the chain rattled against that pipe fencing. And uh, my dog knows that she's not to go outside that gate. And I'm still screaming at uh, Lagatha to come back. And at that point in time, I see her coming uh come running back and she got up to the uh came up to the back porch and her hackles were up all the way from her neck all the way her tail even was bushed out and um and once she got back Cagney quit barking too so um I mean I didn't see a thing but I heard heard it running Mm -hmm. and uh I'm telling you uh, and and Will knows. I was scared. I'm not gonna lie to you. I was scared because that I was like, okay, like I thought you got to get in the house. And I locked everything up, chained everything up, and I was just like, okay, you know what? I don't like this. <laughs> now you're coming up to. I, I know that they had. I know that they've come to the window in the the bedroom before, but I, I'm just. You know what, Will? I'm getting tired of it. <laughs> you know, oh, I yeah. really don't have yeah. this feeling that I want to be. I, I really don't feel like i want to be bosom buddies with them <laughs> probably not something you want to do <laughs> no uh-uh. <laughs> okay let's move on to the next question uh, this person says um it's from kareem he says or she i'm not sure uh so kareem if i you know i'm not sure if you're male or female so you'll have to excuse me um I was thinking maybe the smell Bigfoot emits is from its guts and mouth also. From my experience in fights due to my martial arts experience, people when they're anxious or afraid in fights sometimes, uh, or if they're just nervous or angry, emit a very foul odor from their guts and mouth also. In some cases, it's overpowering and really horrible. So um, they want to know, I suppose, if this is something that would cause odor from a Sasquatch. Any thoughts on that, guys? I, I don't see why not. I mean, what did I mean? That, yeah, I mean, you, don't you? Wouldn't somebody? If you're scared, you sweat, you do weird stuff. So why not have any weird? I I say yeah, that that sounds plausible. In my yeah, in my unscientific realm of understanding and all that kind of stuff. I know we've talked about this first. What are your thoughts? Yeah, we have. Uh, you know, anything's possible. Uh, but uh, I do, of course, I have to relate it back to apes. Uh, your great apes, like uh, chimpan- male chimpanzees and male uh, gorillas, will emit uh, a scent when they get mad. And um, they glands. will also do it sometimes. Yes, it comes from the scent glands, and they have, uh, their glands are pretty much, they have glands that are located in the uh, the, the neck, right in that portion between the neck and uh, um, 
shoulder and then under their arms and then uh, right at the base of uh, right above their anus and um, and of course in their uh, you know private areas Mm -hmm. so uh, they're going to emit smells and they do it too when they're fearful so I mean that's what I would relate it to but you know I, you know, none of us know for sure, so it's anything's possible. But I always leave the, the, the door wide open because anything is possible. Sure. I've got a question for you, uh, Forrest, from this listener. It's from Janice. Janice asks, okay. uh, in a couple of stories I've heard, spreading sulfur around the property lines will discourage Bigfoot visitations. Do you think it works? If so, would carrying a pouch of sulfur on a hike be worthwhile? Um, lastly, uh, Forrest, do you know how primates generally respond to sulfur? I have no idea how primates respond to sulfur. Uh, but you know what? If uh, somebody says that it works and kept them away, I know you say to use bleach. So I actually tried that uh, around the property. However, I think as sulfur and bleach, um, where they 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 work immediately it would be something that i would think that you probably have to continually do all the time to maintain that scent out there right that's why dogs keep that's why dogs go and pee on a, a tree the same tree continually okay this is my boundary but they have to renew that scent cats do the same thing they'll back up and spray uh areas that uh is the limitations of their boundaries and marking their territory and such so but the, you notice that they repeat it all the time so i think the scent probably wanes after a certain period of time so i think that if you were using sulfur or uh bleach whatever you're going to have to do a continual app- application uh right over periods of time and the one thing you note also i mean if if you've got visitations and they've been marking territory you're going to know it because there's going to be a real strong odor uh, so whatever you put out there to counter that has to be a stronger odor than what they place. Yeah. Okay, let's see, let's see. Um, well, this person, same person asked, Kareem asked, uh, this was about John Green. Did his Bigfoot research and books affect his political career in any way? Uh, I know Green, and I can't remember the years. It was I want to say it was the early '80s. Was uh, trying to get into uh, politics in British Columbia. His father was actually um, pretty heavily in Canadian politics, and I want to say he was. And I can't think. I you know, apologize to our Canadian friends. Uh, what the person in charge of uh, one of the provinces is. And I, and I think Green. Are they, minister, are they called ministers? It, it might, I mean, it, I may be wrong. I, I, don't, I don't know. But he, anyway, I think he was. I think Green's father was actually held that position for a time of British Columbia. Um, I could be wrong, but I think that was the case. But anyway, he was heavily involved in politics, and Green tried to make a run, and that was something Rene De Hinden. You know, he was he was all up in arms when he found out Green was going to run for politics, but because he thought he was a crook anyway, and he, he says, "Well, that's a perfect job for him." <laughs> but Renee, you know, Renee would write me. I was when when you know Milo and I were stationed in Germany at the same time in, in the late seventies, and you know Renee would write me every month, and he always talked about. It. He was always giving me the news and what was going on, especially with the people he hated. <laughs> so you know, he would talk talk to me about all these these shady deals that Green had, you know, and I. I wasn't really interested in a lot of that. I was more interested in learning what he had to say about the Sasquatch. But, uh, oh, man. So let me see here. Sorry, folks. I'm, I'm kind of like I'm kind of fumbling through. If you guys want to bring something up, or Milo, if you've got a question while I'm looking here. Oh, this is what? interesting. Oh, what? Let yeah. me bring this up. Um, this person asks... Amy asks, what are your thoughts on the Gugwe that the Choctaw tribe refers to as face eaters? And uh, she asked if I've ever tracked her or had an encounter with one. Uh, I can't say I've had an encounter with a face eater because I still have my face, thankfully, you know. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I don't really know much about that particular topic. I'll have to look that up. Is that something you've heard of, Forrest? Uh, I have. I'm... I'm, I'm 
Okay, this is where I'm going to go with that, and I and tell Amy I apologize if I am going down the wrong road here, but I think a gugwe, I think, is referring to a paranormal possession. I don't think that they're necessarily referring to Bigfoot, but I think it is a paranormal possession because mm-hmm. there was an incident. There was an incident a few years back where a young man was on a bus. Now, y'all might know where I'm going with this. That actually attacked and ate somebody on the bus. And the first thing he did was eat the face off this person. I mean, this was an act. This was actually something that happened in reality. Um, I wouldn't want to have been riding that bus. I, that's all I can say. You know, but anyway, that reminds um, me. You talking about chimps? You know, ripping the face off somebody. Yeah, chimps. So well, wow. that. Yeah, uh, but that. But I think that is what they were all saying that he was possessed of this. It's a, like a demonic type of possession. Okay, and I think that's what the. I think that's what the Google Google way mm-hmm. is referring to. Now. As far as chimpanzees, uh, chimpanzees go for, if you don't have a face, then you don't have recognition, okay? Mm-hmm. They also go for, the, they go for the privates. They will absolutely castrate another chimpanzee. Uh, and I've even seen them attack female chimpanzees' private parts, too. Uh, they will bite them on, and then they bite them in the soft tissue area of the stomach. Uh, and uh, very often time literally ripping the guts out and uh you know they are not well you know how i feel about chimpanzees they're not nice critters no they're not and uh and you know maybe there's a reason that we share you know sometimes humans aren't very nice critters either and um in fact more often than we probably all care to admit and is it does it, do we find it so strange that we share more of our DNA with chimpanzees than any other ape, as far as we know? So, mm-hmm. and I'm not, and I am including Bigfoot in that. So we really don't know how much DNA we share with them, but I'm sure we share a bit. So, um, you know, chimpanzees are just—they're not nice. And by attacking the face, that just completely obliterates. Um, recognition of an animal Mm -hmm. and you know they go for the eyes and blind and i don't know you can get people i tell you if you don't believe me go out there you can actually see a gentleman that had his face ripped off and there's a woman out there too that had hers ripped off by a friend's chimpanzee and uh this gentleman went to to have celebrate a birthday with his chimpanzee it was not his chimpanzee that did it it was another group of them that were jealous because he was there treating his chimpanzee to this cake and these treats and such. And they were, they literally broke out. Uh, so you can see that they, they express a lot of human emotions. And I, ex- I would suspect that, uh, Bigfoot as well, uh, expresses a lot of human type emotions as well. So I'll leave it at that. I'm going to read one more. Uh, And then we'll call this session. But this is from a listener in Australia, uh, from Alex. Alex says, G'day, guys. I live in Melbourne, Australia. I have never seen a Yowie or a Bigfoot, but the subject fascinates me. I've been a subscriber for a few years now and love the show. I would like to ask a weird question. I hear people on your show talk of encounters and seeing the animal looking at them and scream at them. I wonder how it would react if you were to laugh at it? I, I think that's probably yeah. a good question. Yeah. Go find out. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think, Forrest? I mean, well, actually, I think I, I think I know what the answer to that would be. Would be uh, you think you know what the answer is to that? I don't think that you want to direct eye contact and open your mouth showing your teeth. That's right. what I think. It's, it's, a show of, it, so. it's a show of aggression, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he goes on. But you know, I, I will say this: I, I I wish you'd bring those Yowie hunters back on because oh, I yeah, love yeah, yeah. that show that you did with the Yowie, the guys that with the Yowie hunters. Because I tell you what, they have got some of the most fantastic uh, thermal imaging in uh, Australia. 
Well, I'm we, telling you that if you remember that that was absolutely fantastic. We, we really that they got. we really love our friends in Australia. So um, I'll have to contact them and see if they'll come back on. Um, but Alex goes on. He says, like I stated, I've never seen one or prints or anything. Uh, the only thing that happened to me was while I was hunting rabbits about 65 kilometers north of Melbourne, something weird happened. And on this day, I can or to this day, I can't explain it. I was walking on a track where I would normally score a bunny or two. Uh, the track ends where it meets the dirt road, and that's where I normally turn back and head back to camp. When I got to the road, my hair stood up. I had goosebumps, and all of a sudden I felt fear, like something was wrong or, in, or bad in the area. Um, I cannot say why I heard nothing, smelt nothing, everything seemed fine apart from me. It's only the only time this thing has ever happened to me. I backed up and slowly walked back the way I came. Uh, back then... I used to hunt with a 12-gauge pump action shotgun before they got banned here. Uh, all this is nothing exciting, but if you're curious, uh, the area is the King Lake West at the Mount Robertson Plantation here in the state of Victoria. Wish you all a happy new year and a safe, prosperous one. Thank you for the awesome show, and I really appreciate all that you do and share the info and stories and encounters. Kind regards, Alex. Um, you know... We've experienced that, I think, in places, and I'm sure you have too. There are forests where you live because the creatures are around, and all of a sudden, it's like walking into a wall, you know, where you you might have mm -hmm. been calm and, you know, happy, whatever you're doing, and then all of a sudden, your hair stands up, everything is silent. It's just, it's just weird. It's unexplainable. Well, it's our sixth sense. And I think it's a, it, it, we go back to the primordial fear that we've talked about before. I think, you know what, as crazy as this may sound coming from me, I think it's in our DNA. I think that it is in the DNA of every animal to be able to sense. And I don't know whether it's like pheromones that we can't really, that we breathe in and we can sense them, uh, you know, and we don't recognize necessarily a smell, but... You know where I'm going well, with this. I mean, it's just like something that you might, that there's a sensation there that tells you, you know, you heard the, you, you see all these little funny things that they do on uh, the mm -hmm. shorts and everything, run. Well, I think that's what hits you. It's like run, you know. Well, I've always and, wondered if it wasn't, you know, maybe, maybe pheromones trigger genetic memory, you know, yeah. of, of this kind of dealings with this kind of thing in the past. You know, we've just forgotten since those times. But it was such a, it, it, it imprinted so much on us that it became part of genetic memory. And, and when we pick that up, because, and I've mentioned this many times, you know, something you talked about in my psych courses was, um, you know, in the neurobiology courses was uh, people always talk about how, you know, fantastic a dog sense of smell is. And it is, but it, it's, it's not necessarily... I guess in, in being able to pick up minute particles, it's superior to humans. But humans are by far superior because our brains can identify the difference between very, very minute particles of scent and or distinguish between them and identify what they are. We can identify something like 50 different, 50,000 different scents. So what humans can do is really remarkable. So if, we're, if we have that in our genetic memory, um, I think it's very possible it could trigger that kind of response in us. Yeah, and I think we do know that, uh, I think modern society have, uh, people in modern society have lost a lot of their um, use of our senses. Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't think the senses have really disappeared. Um, and they're still there. We just don't they're subdued. practice and don't use them. They're, they, yes, exactly, subdued. Because you just still have primitive tribes out there that will actually hunt by smell. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is not, that in itself is not unusual. They know, they still have those abilities because they use them all the time. Exactly. And I think maybe if we were in a, we were pushed into a more primitive type situation, which God only knows the way this country's going, we may be all be there here pretty <laughs> well, soon. Let's but, hope not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, I think that if you're pushed into a situation where you have to probably use those senses, that they come back. 
and uh, they come back to you. But the only thing that I would advise Alex to do is if you do see a yowie, honey, don't be smiling at them and don't be making direct eye contact and run. And you know and, what he did? Uh, <laughs> what he did was the correct thing, though. When he had that, you know, that feeling, you know, that yes. feeling of dread, he yes. backed out, and left the way he came. He got out of it. That's yeah. exactly mm-hmm. the right response. So good job, Alex. And I, and yeah, and I, and the one thing I I would mention that a lot, you hear hunters sometimes say this, but they go they go right ahead, just bumbling right on ahead. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, I've got a gun, I got a gun, I'm protected. Well, no, you know what? No. Let me tell you something. That 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 feller I saw on the other side of that pane of glass from me. It would take a damn big gun to have brought him down. Well, Milo, and what do you, I'm just telling you, yeah. you don't go out there with a pea shooter or a 22 because it's not going to happen. You're not all you're going to do is piss them off and put yourself in a, for worse trouble. But I mean, a lot of hunters because they're carrying oh, yeah. they're carrying guns, they think, oh well, I, I you know I you know, and you hear them, you've heard tales about this. Oh, I, I had this. Uh, dread come over me, but I went right on bumbling ahead and and did what I did, and then guess what I ran into? Well, oh lordy! You know the one I stood in front of that, and then not the, well, the second one, of course, afterwards. But well, not to me- not to mention any names. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I run into that thing, and and that went through my mind. It's like you know, I, I you know, in a moment you're thinking, shoot. I mean, obviously this isn't going to do anything, and but I couldn't think of anything that I had that would have done really much damage to that creature. And Milo, the one you saw, what, how did you feel about the size of it and what you thought might have taken it down? Nothing we had. A broken flashlight and... <laughs> well, uh, nothing yeah, that so, night. Yeah. But, it, but if you were to have something in your hands, <laughs> do you think that you could have taken it down with something? I, I think with a false sense of confidence, maybe. Yeah. You know... But uh, I, to me, if if I had say I had a twenty two, I would just be aiming for the eyes. I I don't know what else to say. You know, I I just thought I'll shoot in the air, maybe it'll scare it away because I knew the bullet wouldn't do anything. Yeah. I mean, if I well, here's here's the uh, my way of looking at it. If I know I was in imminent danger and you know it could have came right through all that and just took us right oh sure whatever yeah so i i look at that well if it's curious i'm curious but you know and it, I, and it really wanted I, paul anyway so well there we go <laughs> but, and he could have him well I'm, yeah. all, I'm all for that that's true you, you know, know we're gonna feed, feed, feed paul to the bigfoot <laughs> yeah you know hey there's your Okay, so Here's your gift. W- with that, we'll <laughs> with that we'll wrap this session. Thanks for listening, folks. Join us next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William J E V N I N G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>